Consoling Thoughts, Chapter 4 God has given us everything with His divine Son. Great indeed was the gift which the Eternal Father made to the world when He bestowed upon it His own Son. As our Lord Himself says, God so loved the world that He gave it His only begotten Son. How then, says the great Apostle St. Paul, has He not given us every other gift with Him? You remember well, I am sure, the beautiful history of the holy patriarch Joseph, which has already been so often told, but which can never be too much considered. Being viceroy of Egypt, his brothers, who dwelt in Mesopotamia, came suppliantly to him in order to be assisted by him in the extreme necessity to which their good father Jacob and they had been reduced in consequence of the famine which desolated their country. You know also how kindly he sent them back to their father, laden with wheat. But when they brought him little Benjamin, he sent them back, not as on the previous occasion, laden with grain and provisions given only by measure, but also accompanied them with the richest gifts, and with wagons filled with all they could desire. In the same manner we see the Eternal Father acts towards us, for although in the old law, He made very great presents to his people, yet they were always made by measure. On the contrary, in the new law, from the moment of beholding his dear Benjamin, that is to say, our Lord re-entered into his glory, he has opened his most liberal hand to pour forth his gifts and graces on all the faithful most abundantly. As he had said by the prophet Joel, that he would pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh, that is to say, on all men, and not merely on the apostles. Besides, you know what Isaiah says of our Lord, that he should receive infinite graces, and that the gifts of the Holy Spirit would rest upon his head. And the Spirit of the Lord, he says, will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and fortitude, the Spirit of knowledge and piety, and he shall be filled with the fear of the Lord. But why does the prophet say that all these gifts would rest upon our Lord since he neither had nor could have any need for them, being the very source of grace himself. Merely to make us understand that all graces and celestial benedictions should be distributed by him who is our head, allowing them to flow down on us who are his members, I mean to say, children of the Holy Church, of which he is the head. And in proof of this truth, hear what he says in the Canticle of Canticles to his Beloved, Open to me, my spouse, my sister. He calls her spouse on account of the greatness of his love, and sister to testify the purity and sincerity of this love. Open to me, he says to her, but open to me quickly, for my head is full of dew and my locks of the drops of the night. Now the dew and the drops of the night are but one and the same thing. What do you think, then, does this well-beloved of our souls mean to say, unless that he ardently desires his beloved, to open the door of her heart quickly to him, in order that he may be able to pour out his sacred gifts and the graces which he has received most abundantly from his eternal Father, as a due and most precious liquor, of which he wishes to make her a present. It is a thing most certain, and one which ought to greatly console us, that Jesus Christ our Lord and Master, in all the rigor of justice, and with the just price, paid and made satisfaction to God his Father, for all the punishment that we have merited by our sins, and not only for all ours, but for all those of the whole world. This is what the great doctor of the Gentiles declares to the Romans, saying that where sin had abounded, grace superabounded. He had there, he meant to say, sins in abundance, but grace is in superabundance, and by grace we are to understand satisfaction. Our Savior, seeing that the divine majesty of his Father had the interests of human nature extremely at heart without inquiring of the price or of any other thing, at the very first in order to redeem us, presented with a most pure and liberal affection a ransom which neither we nor the angels could procure, a satisfaction much greater than all that the sins of the world could require. Whence, St. Paul says, you are bought with a great price. The price indeed is great, and in harmony with the excellence of the thing. A great deposit was that 
by which our Lord lodged in the hands of the paternal justice all his precious blood, of which the least drop is far more valuable than all the worlds we could ever imagine. It is no wonder, then, that our Lord, having made such a payment, should destroy the decree by which we were delivered over to the hands of the devil, remarks the great apostle. But I beg of you, listen for a little to the theological reason of this. Satisfaction is so much the greater and more valuable as the person who makes it is great, distinguished, and of more merit. Example. If I had received an injury from a prince, and he sends me a footboy in order to be reconciled with me and to make me satisfaction, this is not a great honor. But if he sends me his own son, who makes me satisfaction, and begs me to no longer be offended, this is a great honor. This satisfaction is greater than the injury could have been. And in truth, how is satisfaction to be made for honor, unless by rendering honor? But honor is greater in proportion as he who renders it more exalted. For the least honor that a prince renders is worth incomparably more than all the honors that a man of low condition could render. So much does honor depend on him who gives it. Let us then say, if honor is so much the greater as he who renders it is the more dignified, if satisfaction is so much the greater as he who makes it is the more exalted, what must be the satisfaction of him who is infinitely great? The honor rendered and the satisfaction made by a personage of infinite perfection cannot but be infinite. Let us now see where we are. Our Lord was an infinite being. He satisfied for us. His satisfaction was infinite. Oh, then, how well could David say, in our Lord, there is great mercy and a satisfaction ample and excellent. God, truly infinite, had been offended. Jesus Christ, truly infinite, satisfied. Man had been elevated by pride against God himself. Our Lord was humbled under every creature. Understand this well. Being equal to his Father, he humbled and annihilated himself, even unto death, which is nothing else than a kind of total privation, and therefore God, his Father, gave him a name which is above all names, the name of Jesus, which signifies Savior, as if he had said, He is justly Savior, who, being infinite, has paid the debt in all its rigor with an infinite satisfaction. Consoling Thoughts, Chapter 5 The Love of Jesus in His Incarnation The love of God is always inseparably united with the love of the neighbor. And according as we love God, we likewise love our neighbor. Hence, the love of Jesus Christ towards His Father being infinite, His love towards men is likewise infinite. To give some certain proof of it, from the moment of His holy conception, he loved us with a marvelous love of complacency, for his delights were to be with the children of men and to draw man to him, becoming a man himself in order that, in his humanity, we might be able to approach and see him with our eyes in heaven and by faith, here on earth, in the divine sacrament of the Eucharist. He loved us with a love of benevolence, giving his own divinity to man in such a manner that man became God. He united himself to us by an incomprehensible junction in which he adhered and was pressed to our nature so powerfully, indissolubly, and indescribably, that never was anything so closely joined and pressed to humanity as is now the most holy divinity in the person of the Son of God. He poured himself entirely into us, and so to speak, dissolved his greatness in order to reduce it to our littleness, whence he is called the fountain of living water, the rain and dew of heaven. He annihilated himself, St. Paul says, to arrive at our humanity, to replenish us with his divinity, to overwhelm us with his goodness, to elevate us to his dignity, and to bestow on us the divine existence of children of God. He who dwelt in himself, 
wishing to dwell henceforward in us. He who was living during ages of ages in the bosom of his eternal father, desiring to be made mortal in the womb of his temporal mother. He who had always been God, becoming man for eternity. Ah, how beautiful to look upon him, a little infant for us. Certainly we ought with a hundred thousand times more contentment see this dear little infant lying in the crib than all the potentates of the world sitting on their thrones. This amiable condition of a little infant excites us to love him confidently and to confide ourselves lovingly to him in whom we find all. His poverty and his silence in the manger tell us much greater things than any human eloquence could and raise within our hearts many holy sentiments and affections, above all, a perfect renunciation of the goods and pomps of this world. I do not find any other mystery which so happily blends tenderness with austerity, love with rigor, and sweetness with severity. Let us remain at the feet of this Savior, saying with the spouse in the canticles, I have found him whom my soul loveth. I will hold him, and will not let him go. The infant in the crib does not say a word, and his heart, full of ardor for hours, is manifested only by sighs, tears, and sweet glances. But what great things does this silence say to me? It teaches me to make true mental prayer. It shows me the loving fervor of a heart full of good thoughts, of holy affections, a heart that is afraid to lose their sweetness by expressing them. During his mortal life, the sweet Jesus never heaved a single sigh towards his Father in which we had not a share, or entertained a single thought, which was not for our happiness. Though we were iron through hardness, or straw through weakness, we ought to love him. He is a divine magnet that attracts iron, a celestial amber that attracts straw, in a word, he is the center of all hearts. Pronounce often from the depth of your heart the sacred name of the Savior. It will shed a delicious balm through all the powers of your soul. How happy we should be to have nothing in the understanding but Jesus, in the will but Jesus, in the imagination but Jesus. Let us try and pronounce it often and devoutly. May this divine infant be pleased to bathe our hearts in his blood and to anoint them with his holy name, in order that the good desires which we conceive may be all purpled and perfumed therewith. Let us a thousand times kiss the feet of this Savior and say to him, My heart, O oh my God, desires thee. My eyes seek thee out. I sigh for thy countenance. That is, let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ to consider Him, our mouth ever ready to praise Him, our whole being a thirst to be agreeable to Him. Consoling Thoughts Chapter 6 The Love of Jesus in His Passion The Eternal Father so loved the world that He gave it His only Son. And the Son so loved the will of His Father who desired the salvation of human nature, that without taking into account the meanness or contemptibleness of the thing, he willingly offered a prodigious price for its ransom, namely, his blood, his toils, and his life. Thus our Savior, through love, devoted himself to the will of his Father and to the redemption of the world. He advanced in every mystery of his passion, saying, O oh, my Father, this loved human nature would be sufficiently redeemed by one of my tears, but that would not suffice for the reverence which I owe to thy will and to my love. I wish besides my agony in the garden of olives to be scourged, to be crowned with thorns, to have my body reduced to ruins, and to become as a leper without form or beauty. Thus the sweet Jesus was scourged, crowned, condemned, mocked, and rejected as man, devoted, destined, and dedicated to carry out and endure the opprobriums and ignominies due in punishment to all sins. And he served as a general sacrifice for sin, 
being made, as it were, an anathema, separated from and abandoned by His Eternal Father. The Divine Savior wished to die in the flames of love, because of the infinite charity He bore towards us, and by the force and power of love, that is to say, He would die in love, by love, for love, and of love. This is what He Himself says, No one takes away my life but I lay it down of myself, for I have power to lay it down and to take it up again. He was offered, says Isaiah, because he wished it, his body being by right immortal and impassable on account of the glory of his soul. He rendered it through love and by a miracle mortal and passable. He wished, even after his death, to have his side opened that we might see the thoughts of his heart which were all thoughts of love, and that we might go to him with confidence in order to hide ourselves in his side and to receive from him an abundance of graces and benedictions. In this manner, from the first moment of his life until the present hour, has the kind Jesus been continually drawing arrows, if we may so speak, from the quiver of his love, with which to wound the souls of his lovers showing them clearly that they can never love him near so much as he deserves. My God, could he show more love to sinners than to become a perfect holocaust for their sins? Ah, if we could see the heart of Jesus just as it is, we should die of love for him, since we are mortal as he died of love for us while he was mortal, and as he would die again if he were not now immortal. Nothing has so much power to wound a loving heart as to see another heart wounded for love of it. Oh, that our Lord would change hearts with us, as he did with St. Catherine of Siena, in such a manner that we might have no other heart but his, no other will but his, no other affection or desire but to love him and to be wholly his. The pelican, seeing its little ones stung by serpents, wounds them on all sides with the point of its bill, in order that the venom imparted to the body by the serpents may be extracted with their blood. But seeing them die, it wounds itself and pours out its blood upon them, as if to vivify them with a new life. Its love wounds them, and suddenly, through this same love, it wounds itself. Bees never wound without being wounded to death. Seeing, then, the Savior of our souls wounded with love for us, even to death and the death of the cross, shall not we be wounded with love for him, and with a wound most lovingly dolorous? Never indeed can we love him so much as his love and his death deserve. Ah, if my soul is the spouse of Jesus crucified in suffering, I ought during my whole life to regard it as a great favor to wear his livery that is to say, the nails, the thorns, and the lance. Remember, my soul, that the banquet of his nuptials is prepared of gall and vinegar. Seek not for pleasure or joy in this world. It is too great an honor, O King of glory, to drink with thee the chalice of sorrow. May it never happen to me to refuse this drought, because, O God, says David, it is the beverage of thy beloved. The image of Jesus Christ bruised, wounded, pierced, crushed, crucified, has always been a beautiful mirror of love into which the angels and saints could never cease to gaze, enraptured with sweetness and overflowing with consolation. And if the picture of Abraham wielding the sword of death over his dear and only son had power to make the great Saint Gregory, Bishop of Nyssa, weep as often as he contemplated it, How much more ought the image of our Lord, sacrificing himself on the cross, to move us, a sacrifice which is the source of all the graces we have ever received, and of all our holy resolutions, in such a manner that through it alone we preserve, fortify, and accomplish them. Since then our Lord has so much loved us, that he has equally redeemed all, bedewed us with his divine blood and called us to himself, without excluding anyone. Since he has become all ours to make us all his, giving us his death and his life, to deliver us from eternal death, and to procure us the joys of eternal life, that we may belong to him 
in this mortal life, and yet more perfectly in the next, what remains? What conclusion have we to draw, unless that living, we should no longer live for ourselves, but for Jesus Christ who died for us? That is, we should consecrate to Him every moment of our life, referring to His glory our works, our thoughts, and our affections. My soul, live henceforward amid the scourges and the thorns of thy Savior, and there, as a nightingale in its bush, sing sweetly. Live, Jesus, who didst die that my soul might live. Ah, eternal Father, what can the world return thee for the present thou hast made it of thy only Son? Alas, to redeem a thing so vile as I, the Savior delivered himself to death, and unhappy me, I hesitate to surrender my nothingness to him who has given me everything.